this is a joint presentation uh, on on a study that uh, we've been involved in with Sunesis, uh, and uh, two of us are going to present. Uh, I'll 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 start off by just talking about the the design issues. But the the interesting thing is that the study is over now, and uh, and Jennifer is going to talk about uh, some really interesting features of the study. Uh, the conclusions that has, that have been drawn and where where it is right now in terms of uh, its status it's a it's a it's an adaptive design and uh, as you know adaptive designs are uh, designs in which you can look at the data and make a change to the trial in a in an in an unblinded manner uh, but uh, you have to protect the integrity of the trial. So you have to protect the type one error. You have to protect uh, from operational biases. And there's a, the FDA guidance now, uh, which says, well, you know, we, we're going to break them up into well understood and less well understood uh, designs. Ours, this one is uh, uh, in the less well understood category. Well understood is group sequential. You know, a few years ago, group sequential was less well understood. Uh, and uh, as soon as, adapt, so, you know, people were hesitant to use EAST for even group sequential. And then fortunately, adaptive came along. And so now everyone says, oh, group sequential is fine. And uh, we had a, a spur of sales of EAST for, for group sequential. And now adaptive is uh, less well understood. And in, in adaptive, you talk about unblinded sample size re-estimation, uh, dose selection uh, in, in multi-arm studies, uh, and in even even population enrichment uh, types of designs, uh, where uh, so, something along the lines uh, that Eric was talking about, you know, maybe uh, not not his study, but studies in which you might uh, have a biomarker div uh, dis divided subgroups, and uh, and then you know, in the, as an interim analysis, only only enrich with one subgroup, and you can have switching end switching endpoints is something that's a little tricky. But it, it could be applied, for instance, in, in the study that Kai was talking about, or in, in a diabetes study, we're looking at a possibility. That is that, you know, in a, in a, in a safety study, you're, you're trying to show non-inferiority uh, to uh, MACE events, to cardiovascular risk. Uh, but you could, you could do the following. At an interim analysis, if, if you know that you're going to get uh, non-inferiority uh, at an interim analysis, you have a choice. You could say, well, I'll, 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 I'll take what I'm getting, I'll take the non-inferiority, or I'll continue on and maybe even increase the number of events and try for superiority. So, so that, that, that's what I mean by switching endpoints. And that, that is a possibility. So there are opportunities, of course. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, so that, there's a lot of potential with, group sick, with these adaptive methods. Uh, but, uh, but there are lots of challenges also, uh, which we're going to talk about in this study. Uh, one is the handling of the statistics, and the other, uh, even more important, uh, is the operational issues. Who knows what, when, how do you protect uh, the, 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 the study from, uh, from leaking out? Uh, you know, e even in, the, in the, the question that was raised for, the, for this obesity study, there was an important question that at an interim analysis, you've already shown uh, that you're protected against a hazard ratio of two, that information is known out there. Is that going to cause any kind of operational bias? Over here, the information may be known that you've increased the sample size in the middle of a trial. Could that cause an operational bias? So, so these are the kinds of questions that you have to deal with. And they all, come in, they all came into play in this study of uh, this Valor trial of Vosoroxin uh, versus uh, Cytarabine. ARAC is Cytarabine. It is a, it's a double-blind trial. And so that's one way of protecting against operational bias. It's double-blind. So you, you don't know whether it's treatment uh, or control that you're getting. And uh, the, the, it was a, a, a confirmatory trial. F f f uh, and it, it, it was a, a, because, because it's a rare disease uh, or, or because there's so little uh, going on in uh, acute myeloid leukemia, which is the 
indication, uh, one, only one trial could be, would be done. Would, you, could get, you could get approval with a single trial, single well-controlled uh, well trial. Here's the schema where uh, uh, patients are uh, randomized to the, the treatment, wasoroxin uh, plus cytarabine versus placebo plus cytarabine, and it's double-blind, so patients on placebo are getting a saline uh, infusion. And then uh, there's up to two cycles of induction, and if they, uh, if they respond, if they, if they either get a complete response or a complete response with platelet, uh, then they can go on for consolidation. But the end point is a hard end point. It's, uh, the, the primary end point is overall survival. Okay. The design objective is OS. It was, it was designed for 90% uh, power with an alpha of 0.05, two-sided. And uh, one of the, the goals was to complete the trial uh, in uh, 30 months. So with 24 months of enrollment, and an additional six months of follow-up. Uh, and, uh, and the issue was this, that there, this was, there had been no, uh, no, no uh, controlled, no, no trial of this uh, uh, treatment arm versus the standard of care. The, the, this was a, the, the only prior data on wasoroxin was this uh, single arm uh, data. And this single arm data on 69 patients uh, was the basis for doing the phase three trial. So uh, it, it showed a benefit over what was already available, which had, nothing had been available for, for uh, many, many years, uh, over 15 or 20 years, that, could, uh, that was better than cytarabine, which, uh, which had a median uh, survival of four to five months. So, uh, so, the, so then this, this design, this, tri this trial was, whereas this uh, single arm trial showed a survival, median survival of seven months. And uh, so after uh, a lot of discussion uh, and meta-analyses and discussions with uh, key opinion leaders, it was decided that they would design this trial for, the haz for a hazard ratio to detect five versus seven, or a hazard ratio of 0.71. Then the sponsor's dilemma is that there's a lot of uncertainty about this hazard ratio. Uh, it could be five versus seven, hazard ratio of 0.71, but it could easily be, uh, you know, five versus 6.5, which is a hazard ratio of 0.77. And in one case, you can get away with 450 patients. In another case, you need uh, 700 patients. So uh, uh, the question is, you know, given these constraints and given that you're only going to do one trial, how should you uh, design it? And a sponsor is a small company, doesn't have the resources to upfront take a, a, a very big risk and run a 730 patient trial, uh, which would then be overpowered if their uh, original guess was true which is five versus seven. And so uh, they, uh, they had this uh, difficulty. And, and many times, you know, you assume uh, that you have a, a, a big uh, treatment effect uh, in a pilot study. And, uh, it, and, it, and it turns out that when you do the actual trial, the treatment effect is much less than what you thought it would be. And this is a, a study by Pereira and others in, in JAMA showing that, you know, the pilot or proof of concept often shows something bigger. So, uh, so you could, if, if you had the resources, go for the 732 patient trial, but the sponsor opted for a staged investment, a strategy of staged investment. Start with the, uh, the optimistic assumption that the true hazard ratio is 0.71 and do a one-time interim analysis after 50% of the information arrives, which is after 187 events. So, uh, and, and then uh, either stop for uh, overwhelming efficacy with an O'Brien-Fleming boundary or stop for futility if there's nothing going on, but increase the sample size if, uh, and events, if the interim results are promising. So that's the key idea of this study that 
the investment in the study is milestone driven. Uh, if you meet a certain milestone at the interim analysis, there's investment available to finish the study with a larger uh, number of events and larger sample size, uh, as opposed to upfront having a very big uh, trial. And we uh, uh, then set up this so-called promising zone design where the interim analysis, uh, you could decide whether you had promising results or not based on conditional power. And uh, we uh, fixed the conditional power uh, promising zone to be between 30% and 90%. Uh, and in, in this zone only, would you increase the sample size, a one-time increase. Uh, outside of this zone, there'd be no change. Here's a picture of that type of design uh, that uh, this, this is the original group sequential design. This blue region is the efficacy region where you're, reduce, where you're reducing the hazard and the pink region is the futile region. And this red line is the promising zone. So if at the interim analysis you enter into this zone, there's a one-time increase in the number of events by, uh, by 50%. Uh, here's a, a, a rule, uh, here's another way of looking at it. Uh, at the interim analysis, uh, to the left is the unfavorable zone and to the right is a favorable zone. And in between is a one-time increase uh, of 50%. So you see, uh, uh, there are many different options that are available for uh, increasing the sample size. You could have a a flat zone like this, or you could have a zone which, is, uh, which hits a cap and then gradually tapers off down to uh, a no increase in sample size. But the, this, with this zone, there is no possibility of reverse engineering uh, what could have happened uh, if the sample size is increased. If it's, in, if it's not increased, you don't know whether you're in, in the unfavorable region or in the favorable region. And if it is increased, you don't know uh, whether it's increased due to a conditional power or a Z-statistic at the low end or at the high end. So that, that was uh, uh, one type of design that, that helps protect against operational biases. In other studies, we've used other methods. Uh, this kind of shows you, uh, you know, someone said that uh, group sequential design uh, is a more general uh, case of a Adaptive, actually that's not the case, it's the reverse. An, ad uh, uh, an ad uh, a adaptive design is a, more, is a generalization of a group sequential design. So here you have the, the original group sequential design with, uh, uh, with, with one uh, interim O'Brien Fleming type analysis and, and, no, uh, and, and possible early stopping, but no increase in events. And here is the adaptive design with the promising zone. Uh, so uh, in between, now what happens is if you enter the promising zone, you increase the number of events, so the power, conditional power goes up. So here's a comparison. And so you can always add on an adaptive component to a group sequential design. You start out, you can start out and say, I'm, I'm going to do the best possible group sequential design that I can with the resources that I have. That's my best possible group sequential design. And then there's nothing to stop you from adding an adaptive component to it. And uh, in this case, this is the adaptive component we, adapt, we uh, op, uh, added on. And it, 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 so, the, so the conditional power gets boosted up if, you, uh, if, if in fact the hazard ratio is not that great. And here is the uh, the, the prob probability of entering the hazard, uh, the promising zone, this is a distribution of the test statistic at the interim analysis. And uh, it, this is not a, 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 a solution for any type of uh, uh, condition. It, it, it helps you only when you enter the promising zone, which uh, happens about a third of the time. Here are the results that, uh, at, this is only at the design stage. The actual analysis is different. Uh, but at the, at, at the design stage, we looked at the operating characteristics and presented them to the sponsor to, so that the sponsor could decide uh, and, uh, whether this was a type of design that they wanted to go for. So in, in this uh, top table, 
we, we are saying that let's look at what would happen if we designed the study optimistically, hoping that the true hazard ratio is 0.71, but in fact, in truth, the pessimistic scenario was true, that in truth, the true hazard ratio was 0 0.77. What would, what would the operating characteristics look like if, 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 we, if we had a non-adaptive design and if we had an adaptive design? And we look at it in terms of power, study duration, and sample size. So, uh, so this uh, top first column is the probability of entering the promising zone. Uh, the next columns, next two columns are power for non-adaptive and adaptive. Next two columns are study duration for non-adaptive and adaptive, and last two are sample size. So you can see if you if you don't enter the promising zone, there's no difference whatsoever between the adaptive and the non-adaptive, they're going to exactly the same because you're not going to make any change. You won't change the sample size, you won't change the number of events. Only if you enter the promising zone will there be a change in the, in the operating characteristics. And what happens is that uh, in, in this type of design, 25% uh, of the time you'll be unlucky uh, in, in the sense that you won't enter the promising zone, but you'll enter the unfavorable zone, in which case you have about a 35% chance of success. 40% of the time you'll be lucky, you'll enter the favorable zone, again you won't need to make any change, and you'll have 95% chance of success. But about 1 in 3, 34% of the time, you'll enter the promising zone. Only in those situations will this design help you in, in the sense that the power will now jump from say, about 70% to 90%. But you'll pay for it. You'll pay for it in a longer study. Instead of 29 months, it'll be about 38 months. And instead of 450 patients, you're now going to be at 680 patients. So, so, so you, you can see that, well, uh, this design, uh, it's, it may be, uh, is it worthwhile? Well, it's worthwhile because you don't actually make the investment in the beginning. You make the investment only after the interim results are known. And you make that additional investment uh, in time and patience, uh, knowing that the chances have been, re that the study has been repowered. Now, conditional on where you are, this, you have a 90% chance. So this is purely at the design stage. I'll now turn it over to Jennifer so that she can tell you how this uh, scenario actually unfolded. So I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the challenges with um, adaptive designs. There's really three categories. The concern of introducing some sort of operational bias, inflation of the type one error, and importantly, that you know implementing these could actually uh, not go according to uh, published literature. So things change, things happen in implementation, and how are you going to deal with those because they're not addressed in the sort of perfect world of paper writing and simulations. So um, as Cyrus mentioned, um, adaptive designs are, are really most successful when you can have um, blinded trials and objective endpoints because you want to do everything you can to minimize the chance that someone knows something and could introduce operational bias. In, in this uh, application with this study, we actually introduced uh, another thing, which, which is that the people, the, the sponsor didn't actually know what the particular bounds were. So that was something that was discussed, but ultimately determined by the DMC. So in addition to having this one-time fixed sample size, which allows you not to back calculate where you were in the promising zone, we actually didn't know where the bounds were either. So if we hadn't sample size increase, we knew we were somewhere over here and somewhere over there, but we didn't really know where. And if we did sample size increase, we knew we were somewhere in the middle, but, but where in the middle, we had no idea. So these were extra measures to try and uh, have as little information as possible arise out of the results of the interim analysis. And another, um, another piece here is it's, it's good to think in advance about all sort of stakeholders at the company about what the communication plan will be. So at the time of the interim, what will be announced or not announced? Uh, what, who 
thinks it's, it's almost like you have to talk up front with various people, not just statisticians or some clinical, but regulatory lawyers, everybody. Everybody has to be on the same page about what it is that you'll say and if you're comfortable saying that. And then another, um, another thing is it's really hard to prove a negative with operational bias. So you can look and you can say, well, we saw no evidence of it, but uh, maybe you didn't assess the place where there was operational bias, or maybe you don't have the variable where you could see that there was some kind of bias. So you can never know for sure. You can look and you can you know, be comforted by that, but, but it's hard to know, it's hard to, to be assured that you haven't introduced something. And uh, another piece is that we know that we'll see differences between the interim and the end because all of these things are random variables. The outcome is random, the patients enrolled are random. And so you may see some differences and if you see differences, how do you know if that's somewhat random or a piece of operational bias and so on? So it's good to think about uh, how it is that you'll convince yourself that you, uh, uh, that it's unlikely that you have uh, operational bias. The things that we looked at were comparing baseline characteristics before and after the interim to see if the same types of patients were enrolled before and after. Uh, we looked at the treatment practice and follow-up, and we looked at outcome variables to see if there was any difference in, um, in outcome before and after the interim. And this last one is especially tricky with survival analysis because uh, the patients enrolled prior to the interim are still on study, some of them anyway, after the interim. So you have to start thinking, do I want to look at their behavior only up to the point of the interim? Do I want to look at their behavior as a group past the interim? Um, so, and, and then the other piece is that the, uh, the analysis at the interim is confounded with follow-up time. So if you do, it's not like a response rate where you, know, you, you have the same follow-up before and after and they have the same kind of chance of getting a response. The, the, the Kaplan-Meier curve of the interim is heavily weighted towards the first part of the curve. So if you're looking at the outcome there and the outcome at the end, you're confounding that with, um, with uh, follow-up. So there's, there are things to think through about how it is that you will um, an analyze whether you think there's been any operational bias. Okay, so because uh, we had uh, the generalized a promising zone, and <laughs> our lower bound was 30% conditional power, we had to do the CHW adjustment. And essentially, I'll walk through this a little bit quickly, but D1 and D2 are the pre-specified total events at the interim and final analysis. So originally we had 187 events at the interim, 375 at the end. And LR1 and LR2 are the corresponding log rank statistics at the interim at the end. Now imagine you sample size increase, so this D2 now becomes D2 star. So we have now 50% more events, so 562 events for D2 star. And LR2 star is now also the corresponding log rank at the increased final um, 562 events. So uh, what you want to do to preserve the type 1 error is create independent increments for before and after the interim. So you want a log rank at the time of the interim, and you want an independent increment for after the interim. And if this had been you know, a CR rate or where you have patients before and patients after, it's necessarily independent because they're different patients. But here, you have the same patients kind of carrying on until after. So you have to have a method to create independent increments. So uh, the way to create the independent increment for the time period after the interim is to do this piece right here, where you essentially take the log rank from the final, 562, and subtract out the log rank for the interim. And that gives you this piece for the post-interim uh, independent increment. And you're weighting it by the events that you have corresponding to these statistics. So now you have the log rank in the interim, that's the first piece, and you have this final log rank minus log rank at the interim independent increment corresponding to the data after the interim. And then you weight these according to the pre-specified information 
prior to the sample size increase. So here it's 187 out of a 375, so 50% information. So this first uh, interim piece would be weighted of the square root of 0.5, and this second independent increment would be rated square root of 0.5. So uh, you essentially are downweighting, and this is kind of a standard method for some of these, you're downweighting the second piece here uh, because you have increased the sample size based on observed information. And if you do this, you will control the type 1 error. So this uh, CHW method essentially pardon the, you know, sports analogy, I'm really not a sports person, but uh, adjust the football, not the goalpost. So we're changing the statistic um, to control the type 1 error. Now this, as Cyrus mentioned, this is um, both group sequential methods and adaptive here because we had an interim uh, O'Brien Fleming efficacy analysis. So we also have to adjust the alpha at the end, or the critical value at the end, um, to account for the interim efficacy analysis. So we have to employ a weighted statistics statistic to account for the fact that we increase the sample size at the interim, and we have to adjust the end critical value to account for the fact that we could have stopped early according to the O'Brien Fleming um, criteria. So if the interim happens at the planned time, this is kind of, actually I find this amazing, if the interim happens at the planned time, this O'Brien Fleming alpha spending calculation, the usual thing applies. So you make no changes. The adjustment that you do remains the adjustment you would have done independent of any sample size increase, CHW, anything. So you, you um, kind of use the usual methods here. So you make two adjustments. Now what if the interim happens at a point other than the 50% specified? Um, so suppose instead of doing the interim at 187 events, you do it at 175 events. This uh, CHW football adjustment, uh, the weights for the two pieces will remain the same. So they have to remain as the square root of 187 over 375. And so square root of 0.5, square root of 0.5. So even though the interim happened a little earlier, you had these pre-specified weights, they remain. And that's how you control the type 1 error. The part that will change which is sort of interesting, is this piece over here, when you're calculating the independent increment, you'll now use the observed events, because you really are using the data there. You're using the whole log rank, you're doing the subtraction. So here, these D1s will be based on the actual observed events at the interim. But these D1s here would be pre-specified. So you have to make a little adjustment if the interim happens at a different point. And then uh, a little adjustment to the O'Brien Fleming too. So the alpha spending piece would be based on the 175 over 375 is what you would normally do if you did an interim analysis a little bit early. Uh, but there needs to be a slight adjustment because the correlation between the statistics at the interim look and at the end are a little different because it's an adjusted statistic. So you have to account for that. So there's a, there's a slight adjustment, but if you do that, again, the type one error would be controlled. So, Performing this test a little early, we have methods to still ensure that the type 1 error will be contained. And then another, I think, kind of interesting question is, uh, so our primary analysis for overall survival was log rank. Uh, how do you fit a stratified log rank if CHW, your weighted statistic, is your, um, is your statistic? And the question was, do you have to fit this little weighted thing <laughs> in each of the strata? Or can you do a stratified test at the interim and a stratified test at the end and then weight those? And so this is something that Cyrus and I discussed. And um, it turns out it's nice. You can actually fit a proper stratified test at the interim and stratify at the end and then put those pieces together with this weighting. Um, but one, one thing to keep in mind, and actually with the Valor study, we pre-specified uh, an unstratified test um, for a couple reasons. One, there was some uncertainty about how to implement the CHW, and two, uh, there was some concern about small sample sizes at the interim. So unlike a normal study where you're basically doing your analysis at the end, here you're wading in that piece at the interim into your final analysis, 
So the cell sizes at the interim matter now, not just the cell sizes at the end. So it's important to, to keep that in mind when you're um, determining what, what test you want or how many um, strat stratification factors you want at, at randomization. Okay, so another, I thought, I, I thought this was really interesting <laughs> when we were doing this trial. Um, so at the interim, there's, a, there's the data that you had when you cut the data and the DMC met. But then, and that is the data that determined whether you would sample size adjust or not. And in published papers, that matches the data that you use in your final analysis because data don't change. But in real life, the data at the interim aren't perfectly clean. And so you can have death dates that are changed. And importantly, you can have follow-up. So the censoring date changes because you may not, your follow-up increases on these patients. And so the question was, when you do this analysis, according to the, th which would match the theory better to use the um, observed value upon which the rule to increase the sample size was based or to use the recalculated value based on the final data? And uh, we consulted with uh, kind of many expert statisticians and got different answers. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's not really a straightforward question. And in the end, in our particular implementation of this, we felt that um, a few things. Number one, the uh, rule to increase uh, was this 50% increase all or nothing. So the increase, the magnitude of the increase was not tied to the exact observed value of this interim. It was really an all or nothing trigger. So it kind of already removes it a little bit from the particular value, that's one. Two is it felt weird to have your final analysis incorporate dirty data from an interim. That just felt like that's not right. Um, and then there was also some practical questions of uh, how, how would you do that? Would you hard code that interim value into your SAS programs? Would you have to preserve, use the, the data that was preserved at the time of the interim, would you have to package that into SDTM and give it to the FDA so they could recreate it? I mean, what a nightmare. So in the end, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that it's really, so in the end, we, we felt pretty confident that the answer in our case was to recreate the final you recreate the interim test statistic using the final data. And some other uh, kind of points to consider is we felt strongly that after the interim analysis, we shouldn't amend the SAP. And it's, it, is, it is always nice to have the ability to amend the SAP. <laughs> and so there were times we, for instance, we introduced um, uh, an external adjudication committee for our response endpoint. And we toyed, well, we'd like to put that in the SAP, but we don't want the sort of optics of amending the SAP. And so we actually shoved it into a inter external review committee charter. Um, so we kind of had to finagle a little to not amend the SAP. And maybe this was overkill and it would have been fine if we, because realize we weren't gonna amend the primary analysis piece, but we just didn't want, you know, Pazder standing up there saying they amended the SAP after the interim or something. So we just wanted to avoid any kind of concern whatsoever. Um, and this also came up at the end when our events were coming in very slowly and we wanted to change how we defined the end of the study. We felt again that we were sort of hamstrung a little um, by this SAP. So now we get to the results. Uh, the results at the interim for the overall survival hazard ratio was 0.76. Uh, the conditional power was in the promising zone and so the sample size was increased and both the sample size and events were increased by 50%. And then at the end of the trial, the primary endpoint of overall survival was 7.5 months on the Vosroxen arm versus 6.1 on the placebo. And the unstratified log rank, which was our primary analysis, had a p-value of 0.06. This is every statistician's worst nightmare, really, or every company's, <laughs> <laughs> maybe every company's worst nightmare. Uh, and and uh, a hazard ratio of 0.87. And interestingly, the stratified log rank Again, we pre-specified to have this CHW adjustment had a p-value of 0.02, which makes sense because it's capitalizing on um, partitioning out uh, the variability. Uh, and then our single secondary endpoint of complete response rate was 30% on the Vosroxen arm and 16% on the placebo arm, 
with a p-value with more zeros than this. So really very, very, very significant. Um, and so one thing to note also is the hazard ratio at the interim did change over time. So we, you know, we did all this. So is this 0.87 different than 0.76? I don't know. We've done lots of looking you know, to, to ask what, what do we make of that. Um, but I, I bring that up as a, an example where you know, when you're faced with results, you'll have to ask those questions about, is this difference a meaningful difference? So in, in conclusion, uh, the totality of data suggests benefit for vosoroxin uh, in this disease setting. And the adaptive design played an important role in demonstrating drug activity because, in fact, the observed hazard ratio was substantially worse than the original 0.71 assumed hazard ratio. And so it was good that we sample size increased. Uh, having a staged investment allowed us to get an influx of money to carry out the second portion of the trial. And we did a lot of thinking to figure out how to actually mostly uh, eliminate operational bias, but even how to implement some of these uh, methods to control the type 1 error. And um, part of why I wanted to come today is that I think when we implement these trials, they often, like, we're, like I was saying, they, they don't match theory. They don't line up with papers perfectly or even simulations perfectly. And you know, we need to talk to each other about how it is or what, what obstacles did you face and how do you overcome them prior to starting a trial so we can do them in a better fashion. And that's the end. Thank you.